Good evening, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's maybe not such a well-known fact, and maybe it's, well, it's certainly a bit uh, counterintuitive that the, the second M in FM, and it's, it's actually a P, really. It stands for macroeconomic policy. I added tentative to the, uh, uh, to the title that's on, on, on the program. The, the, the background to that is that uh, you know, I'm very happy to speak here. I would be even happier if the sort of research project that's sort of underlying my commitment uh, several months ago to to, uh, to make this speech, uh, I'd be even happier if that was a bit further down the road than it than it, than it is. Um, I'll, I'll say a word about that now in in uh, in a second. So this is what what I'd like to do: um, present a little bit of just data, just to give you again a few, few stylized uh, facts about the inflationary episode we've had um, over the last 18 months or so. Uh, or tw 20 months maybe in in uh, um, in Europe. Uh, brief slide on the response at uh, EU, EU level. We have a you know, multi-level governance system uh, here in, uh, in, in in Europe, so we need to say a word about the European level. But focus mainly then on the national uh, the national policy packages. Um, present an overview of those. Of course, it's a lot of detail in there. I'm going to try and sort of pick out the most important elements. Um, then talk about, you know, try and explain uh, uh, what's going on here a little bit in using this idea of uh, policy trade-offs, why it's difficult for governments to come up with, with sort of simple uh, packages to deal with, uh, uh, with inflation. And then, as I say, it's very provisional then to, to think a little bit through some issues about effectiveness and, 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 and the trade-offs. So the background is, um, is some case studies. So last year, the IMK and the uh, Chamber of Labour, the Arbeiterkammer in, in Vienna, uh, we commissioned some uh, uh, some national reports. You can find those uh, on, on the IMK website, indeed on the ARCAR website. Um, so they cover the sort of period up until more or less this time last year, so into November uh, um, of last year. Um, and we wanted to, to update that. Um, and, uh, uh, and we are in the process of updating that. It should come out as, a, as, a, as an open book uh, uh, publication. And, and the, the research papers are now are just, uh, have just come in. Uh, so the countries covered are Austria, Croatia, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. Slightly eclectic mix, mix but we certainly have the big uh, uh, euro area economies in there and uh, the Eastern European Countries are very interesting, although I'm not an expert in those countries, and I won't say very much about them in this uh, in this presentation. Let me just say, I can't with this lighting here. I can't really, basically, apart from the first two rows, see anybody here. But uh, I know, or I think I know, that uh, Christoph Fieras and uh, Jorge uh, Uxo are in the audience. They're certainly at this conference, um, and they uh, uh, authors or co-authors of the Spanish or the the Greece, the Greek, and the Spanish uh, papers, respectively. So, any difficult questions? Um, uh, about those countries uh, uh, will, I'm sure, gladly be taken by those uh, colleagues. So let's just run through quickly through the stylized facts without taking uh, uh, too much time again. The first slide is certainly nothing you're, you're not aware of. I mean, looking back, actually, you know, we talked a lot in the, over the years in this conference about, you know, is it the job of monetary policy just to look after inflation and stuff? Whoever job it is, actually, for many years in the, in the, in the Euro area, you know, a good job was done by, by somebody, or certainly the outcomes were, were actually pretty successful, very close to the 2% target, if you think the 2% target is right. Um, even in the, in the Great Recession, there was, a, there was a blip up and a blip down, um, but it was fairly limited in time. Since then, though, things have been pretty much a disaster. I mean, you know, an inability over, you know, more or less 10 years to, to, get, to get inflation back up to target, uh, with a short exception, and now sort of overshooting very much on the, uh, on the upside, although with a sharp, certainly over this time period, it looks like really quite a sharp uh, downturn again in inflation. Okay, that's pretty much well known. This may be a little bit less so. So here I just, you know, in, in grey, just sort of plotted all the um, all the euro area countries and the, uh, the 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 black line, which you can just about see, which is, you know, unsurprisingly in the middle for the euro area average to kick off. Um, just to emphasize that, uh, you know, that, that, that average um, conceals quite a, a wide range of inflationary experiences by the different countries. And I'll say a little bit of, uh, about that, about the countries in our study and about the countries at the top of that distribution 
in, uh, in the, next, uh, the, the next slide. So here's the, uh, I call this Baltic high. Uh, you may know the Baltic dry index, so that seemed to uh, be a nice way to put it. So basically, these are small, open uh, Baltic economies uh, at the top of, top of the distribution, uh, obviously very exposed to uh, uh, to what's been uh, happening now in, uh, with, with uh, uh, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, uh, and also they were, uh, also before this inflation period, also at the top of the distribution, even though it was much more compressed. Um, you know, it, they were actually cyclically in a, in a, in a very strong, uh, strong position. Um, so here, here these are the, the countries on the next two slides uh, covered by the... Uh, um, uh, um, covered by the by the study, it's a, I'm, I hope reasonably easy easy to see. So, I mean, what, um, uh, uh, what you see here is the uh, is the case of Austria, for example, the the orange line, um, which is initially sort of very close to the uh, euro ever average, is now uh, you know in a sustained way um, uh, quite considerably above the, uh, uh, above the euro area average, indeed one of the highest inflation rates now, uh, in, in, in Europe. The Netherlands is a case with a very, um, you know, er erratic and quite, uh, you know, strongly rising, but then also strongly falling, um, um, inflation rate. I mean, as I, I won't be able to go into detail in all these countries. One of the things you need to know about the, the Netherlands is, is, is that, uh, is, is, is that um, there's a specific way that they've measured uh, uh, gas prices in, in, the, in the Dutch economy. So this is partly a, a sort of statistical um, artifact. I'll say a word about that in a, um, in a second. Um, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the Greek case, uh, you see actually a strong uh, performance in terms of uh, inflation reduction uh, from a, a, a higher level roughly in the middle of the, uh, of the distribution. Um, and the other countries, so Spain, I'll say a few words about Spain, and I'll say, if he's here, I hope uh, Jorge will, will, will maybe add something about Spain. Spain is a very interesting uh, uh, country because it's, it's now essentially one of the best performers um, in, in the euro. And you see the red line is quite dramatic reduction in, uh, in the Spanish inflation rate from a not dr dramatically, but somewhat above euro area, which to now one of the, as I say, the, the or what it has been at part time uh, times, and now is one of the the, um, the, the best um, the, uh, the best performers. More or less, a sort of opposite case in Italy, which initially was quite successful in keeping inflation uh, at least somewhat below the euro area average. More recently, has been uh, uh, quite considerably above it, which I interpret as a sort of being. A bit of a sign of sort of policy exhaustion that the, the, the country was initially spending a lot of money to uh, to to keep uh, inflation down, and at some point that had to be relaxed, and that that's uh, led to this surge, surge in inflation. Um, what have I have I missed anything? No, no. France. I didn't say anything about France. So. Um. So France, uh, France is, is, a, is a, uh, well, it's a bit of a, 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 a mixed case in terms of being uh, successful in having, uh, over the entire period, a, uh, a below average um, inflation rate. Um, um, but maybe somewhat similarly to, uh, uh, to Italy, one could imagine that the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the policy space has, has become constricted because uh, the line has gradually grown up towards the uh, towards the euro area, euro area average. So this is the, these are sort of stylized. But here's just the, late, the latest at the time I did this graph for August um, uh, in, inflation rates. Um, across the uh, across the area, I, we don't need to discuss the different countries now. Just note the the, the very strong strong differences that we have in in, in, in Europe, right? And just a just a reminder, without sort of you know dragging up your nightmares uh, from the from the euro crisis, you know that this is not good, right? Uh, I mean, it, it's it's okay for for a short time, but you know inflation rate differentials uh, of this of this magnitude um, w within a common currency area are, are are bad news, right? And and this is a recipe indeed for for renewed tensions uh, in the uh, in, in the euro area. Okay, so let's um, 
go on to the uh, uh, you know what what could what could explain these and I think with these th sort of four factors you could in principle tell a story about all these different countries. Um, so uh, and I'm just going to mention the first three and then talk a little bit obviously more about the the, the policy. So th I think there's four things you could use to explain this. So one is the I mentioned it the, the different cyclical dynamics that you know different euro area countries let's say we're in when the inflationary shit uh, when the when the inflationary shock hit, I have to be careful how you say that, um, um, and that, that applies to certain uh, uh, Central and Eastern Euro, uh, European countries, indeed, uh, countries like Hungary and Poland that we have in our sample, but I'm not going to say very much about, about here. Then there's a the different, like the structure of the, of the economies, in particular in this case, then the exposure to changes in international um, and energy prices, right? So how, you know, how much gas do you import? Do you have your own supplies of coal or, or nuclear energy or, or, or whatever? Um, and, uh, and maybe measurement issues. Again, I'm not going to say about this, uh, much about this. Certainly, I mean, we have the, it's, ha it's called the harmonized uh, index of consumer prices. In fact, it's, what I've learned is it's not actually quite as harmonized as one, one might think, right? And it, measuring inflation is actually not a trivial, trivial exercise, right? And if you think about gas prices and you think about how, you know, the sort of stage process by which a rise in, in, in wholesale prices gets passed on to consumers who have different contracts of different lengths, it's not hard to imagine. Uh, maybe there's experts in the room on this, this was somewhat, somewhat new to me, uh, you know, the different, different statistical offices or central banks take different views on, on how fast this process goes, and that leads to changes. So in, in the Dutch report, the, the colleague uh, Wim Zoika goes into this in, the, in, in, in some detail. Okay, so what, what I want to focus on, though, is, is, is more about this issue about the, the success of uh, policies and uh, institutions. So look a little bit about what's been deployed, this issue about uh, what can be sustained um, economically, and then go a little bit into the, uh, into the uh, this idea of trade-offs, right? So uh, just to ask you to appreciate, so there's 10, there's 10 uh, countries in our study, of course, uh, uh, what is it, 20 now in the euro area, 27 European area. I can't go into, into too many details about these uh, countries. I'm going to try and pick out some, what I seem to me to be uh, um, important uh, uh, issues. Okay, firstly, I need to do, just uh, remind you of this. So, the, you know, as a precondition, uh, it shouldn't be forgotten for the policy activities of the uh, um, of the member states, was that the the rules governing economic policy in the member states uh, were uh, were relaxed. They had been relaxed already, thanks to thanks to COVID. Um, so COVID maybe did have, you know, the occasional advantage, uh, one could say. Um, so the, the fiscal rules have been suspended in, in March uh, 2022, and the state aid rules, which, which limit what uh, governments can spend to support uh, companies notably, uh, had also been relaxed. And these were essentially, to, to cut a long story short, were sort of extended and expanded to some extent in the, as a result of the inflationary crisis. And without that, the, you know, the, the countries would have been hamstrung. Um, in addition, there was, a, a, there was a, a series of initiatives also by the European level. I won't go into too many details. The, the most important was what was called this Repower EU. The EU has got a nasty habit now of, of coining these rather unpleasant sort of titles for things, but whatever. Um, so there's a, a whole different sort of packages in there about saving energy, an important initiative to get uh, windfall profits that um, the, the, the non-marginal producers of electricity um, uh, were earning because the uh, it was merit order pricing. The, uh, they were getting yeah windfall profits because they were because the price of electricity was determined by the the, the marginal provider, which was gas, and that was expensive. Um, uh, so there's an EU scheme uh, that countries were, were to follow to, uh, to to compensate for that. Uh, some 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 other issues. Perhaps the most important thing is the last one that um, the the recovery and resilience fund that was established again as a, a response to COVID was sort of boosted and uh, uh, bolstered and, and repurposed to some extent um, under this uh, under this program. And that's helped uh, uh, some countries, um, Italy, Italy notably, uh, uh, the RF to 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 weather the to weather crisis. Okay, so this is actually probably the the most uh, as I say, for, for you know, for this sort of comments without doing a whole workshop on 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 on, on each country made the the most useful thing thing to look at. I mean, this is like just a sort of tick box uh, of the different um, uh, of the different policies uh, from uh, uh, you know comparative perspective for the for the for the ten countries. Again, I won't even now here 
go through all these tick boxes, but what, what, you, what you see is a number of things. What you see is a lot of ticks, right? So, I mean, we, we asked the authors to, to classify the initiatives according to this, um, uh, to this, uh, um, to this scheme, so different forms of uh, uh, tax cuts, uh, controls of retail or wholesale prices, um, you know, orders to state-owned companies to to follow certain certain policies, windfall profits and transfers to firms and households. Uh, essentially, I'll come to the last one in just a second. Um, and, and what you see is, is actually a lot of different policies. So most there's some, some differences between the countries. Uh, Hungary was a bit more restrictive, for example, in which policies it deployed. But essentially, all the uh, countries deployed a whole wide range of, of policies. Okay, what, why is that important? Well, uh, I tried to make a joke about here. No, no Hayekins in, in a foxhole. I mean, I mean, the, the wear voice is certainly in, in, in Germany at the very start of the crisis, sort of saying, oh, well, this is relative price change and it's all imported anyway, so we're all poorer, so we have to just, you know, get used to it. I mean, there the were some voices saying that, but pretty quickly, you know, governments, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, took, took action. Uh, um, and uh, not, maybe not immediately, some, some faster, some more slowly. Um, but essentially, no governments just sort of said, okay, this is just relative prices, so we we're not going to do anything. Right. So most of them offered uh, a, a broad uh, a range of, uh, um, of policies, according to the, this categorization here, um, um, which I think has two, uh, two aspects to it. Um, one, is, one is about this issue about trade-offs, right? So uh, if you've got trade-offs in policies, you're unlikely to sort of, uh, you know, with one brilliant policy to sort of so solve all these issues. So I think that's, that's one reason. Um, and the other is, of course, that uh, yeah, as I'm most familiar with here in, here in Germany, uh, you know, this sort of political game sort of came into place. You know, the government will come up with one policy which benefited sort of one constituency, then another constituency, oh, well, then we want this and this. You know, so you ended up with these broader packages to try and sort of put together, uh, uh, you know, policy parcels that, that, that were uh, electorally uh, also uh, successful and interesting for the, for the politicians. Ah, so the, 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 we did ask a question specifically about, <coughs> excuse me, about, about wage setting, and we have some interesting uh, uh, reports about some uh, discussions that took place between social partners and governments in the various countries. Mm. But as you can see, this is the one, the one line in the, in the, in, in the table that, that's sort of more or less empty. Um, and, and, you know, we, str we struggled to, to really identify countries which had really, you know, sat down and, and, and thrashed out a, um, a sort of formalized uh, social pact, you know, as uh, post-Keynesian uh, economists like to uh, tend to recommend in these sort of situations even more generally, um, that's hard to find. I mean, we can discuss the German case maybe in the, uh, um, uh, in the, dis in the discussion. You see I put a, a question mark there. Um, I mean, the, the, there was a, a so-called concerted action where there were some meetings between the heads of the unions, the employers, and, and the government. Um, what really concretely came out of that is a bit discussable. It's a little bit of a black box. Uh, the main policy outcome, I think, was, was these, which I'll talk about, these... Um, uh, making one-off wage payments free of taxation and social contributions up to uh, 3,000 euros over, over two years, so quite a, quite a, a large amount of money. Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, the collective bargain is availed of this opportunity to a very considerable extent. Um, so that you know, that's pro perhaps justifies the, uh, the, uh, the question mark. Uh, I put a, a tick next to next to Spain again. Jorge is here. You maybe want to comment on this. Um, the, initially, the the end, there was also conflictual relations in Spain uh, uh, last year. But in the in the uh, the latest report, uh, which I have managed to read, uh, there there is an agreement between the social partners. Um, whether you can really call that a social pact or not, I don't know. But anyway. Anyway, the, the, the main message is that it's, it's quite uh, uh, limited. Okay, so these tick boxes are useful to get a sort of qualitative uh, picture of, of what's going on. Of course, um, that doesn't tell you how intensive the measures are, right? It just tells you whether, you know, what, was there a cut in, in taxation or a cut in VAT? So, uh, of, course we'd, we'd like, of course, we'd like to get a sense of how, how big the, the, the measures are, and, and this is why, why I talk about uh, tentative now in the, in, in, in the title. So the, the colleagues at the Bruegel Institute, some of you know, I'm sure, in, uh, 
in, uh, in Brussels um, have been putting together a database um, of, uh, uh, of measures. And here the most interesting thing is to look on the, uh, the left uh, uh, axis, uh, and that's uh, percentages of GDP, and that's um, uh, for 2022. Um, so their data are a bit old, uh, but you see, uh, uh, without going into the details, really quite considerable numbers here, 4% uh, of GDP, 3% of GDP, quite uh, quite common. So I've just gone through the reports that we've now received and tried just to, uh, uh, just to pull out the numbers. Uh, so again, this is provisional. I may have, you know, in, 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 the, in the speed with which I did it, have, 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 have misread some things here. Um, but in, in certainly most of the European, uh, Western European countries, um, uh, in, in most years we see uh, uh, quite considerably smaller numbers than those. Uh, not though in, uh, uh, in Croatia, in Greece, uh, also very substantial numbers and in, in last year. And the figure for this year is only until May. Uh, and fairly considerable, sort of consistent with the Bruegel numbers in uh, uh, in, uh, in Poland also, uh, but the other numbers I have uh, for the other Western European countries are quite considerably lower uh, than the um, uh, than the Bruegel numbers. So that's again something that has to be uh, uh, has to be checked. The German numbers are from my from my own institute, so they're certainly correct. Uh, so here, obviously, the Bruegel numbers are wrong. But uh, for the other things, I don't know. We need to we need to we need to look a little bit other, uh, uh, into in, into that. In, in any in any case. Um, uh, you know, even if, I mean, let you, just for the sake of argument, if you sort of took some numbers in, a bit in the middle of these two estimates, um, then there's still, you know, fairly considerable uh, uh, percentages of GDP that were, uh, that were spent. Well, I mean, what, what, again, like, like, like I said about measuring inflation, what, you know, what, why, why might that be? Well, it's actually, you know, not conceptually also not easy to, to, uh, to ascertain the, the, the value of, of, of measures like this as a proportion of GDP. I mean, what exactly is a counterinflationary measure? My, you know, opinions could differ on that. Um, the announcements are made in, in, in the budget, the sort of allocation for a certain, uh, a certain measure, but often this allocation is naturally then taken up. You know? Partly because the, 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 the benefit or, or, the, or the price cap might depend or the, the amount of expenditure necessary might depend on movements in the market price, for example, as is the case of the, the gas price break. Um, so, the, you know, the, there's a lot of room there for, uh, uh, for things to be, uh, uh, you know, to seen in different ways. So there's a couple of other points, but I, I see I'm getting a little bit out of time, so I'm going I'm to run it. Okay, let's, let's turn in quickly to the... Um, um, to, to the trade-offs, um, I mean, let me just mention a few then to, to say some time. I mean, often you know you see this, uh, you know, it used to be called the three the three T's um, for fiscal policy. You know, timely, targeted, uh, temporary. Now, often here we talk about the four T's, so transformative, so linking to the, uh, you know, the policy show, you know, promote the the decarbonisation agenda essentially. Um, so, I mean, I give some examples now here of the, of the trade-offs that the governments uh, face that are a little bit linked to this, uh, to this idea, or at least some of them are, you know, whether to, whether to, to bolster the consumption or the incomes of, of, the, of the needy versus, you know, protecting our, uh, uh, protecting our industries. We're seeing a big debate on that now in Germany in the context of electricity prices, for, for example. Um, um, you know, Avoiding fuel poverty um, in a trade-off situation with this idea that well we need to we need to uh, reduce energy consumption and we can't be subsidising people for their consumption of um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, the whole issue about how how easy it is to target measures, no? and if you if you target them, does it make it administratively more cumbersome, more complex? Is it then also uh, uh, do you lose out on the timely aspect? Right. So the, there's a whole. Uh, uh, um, a uh, series of trade-offs here that, that um, you, can, you can go into. How many moments do I have, Dawson? Uh, one. Well, oh, okay, so then I won't talk about those anymore. So let me, so I've, I've got a few, a few, two more slides basically on, uh, uh, one on, on the distributional concerns and, and the trade-offs and, and, um, and then on the climate one. So maybe I'll try, I might need two minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think on, on the distributional uh, concerns in terms of, uh, you know, 
normative policy, but also in terms of sort of at least fairly standards of Keynesian economics, there's a, there's a strong argument for, you know, focusing the, the cushioning of the shock uh, uh, on the uh, on the low income low income households. You, uh, apart from the normative aspect, you you also get the greatest stabilisation effect on, on this uh, uh, by this. Uh, Means what, what we we've seen also in our analysis of, of Germany, the IMK, and it comes out of some of the studies though, is is that you it, it's hard to map uh, inflation uh, um, impact and also the impact of you know classic sort of policies like reducing VAT and subsidising income, subsidising fuel, to map that clearly onto a sort of standard uh, distribution of, of income deciles, right? Because there's a huge variation within the, within these uh, within these deciles. Uh, depending, for example, on pe whether people live in rural areas or urban areas, whether they're car owners or not, whether they have kids or not, things like that. So it's, it's really quite hard to, to, to map these things uh, map these things together. I mean, generally speaking, of course, if you if you cap, uh, you know, essentials like like food and, and energy prices, um, then then uh, these households benefit more. It's a more important share of their of their income, uh, 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 right? But but that's not always the case, and if, particularly subsidisation of, of vehicle fuels. Uh, poor households often don't have cars. Uh, at least maybe in the U.S. they do, but not not in Europe. Um, so so the, the you know the, 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 some of the policies were, were arguably actively sort of redistributing income. Uh, 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 above, the colleagues at the IMK, not myself, but they did a very detailed study, which uh, in German, yeah, if you read German, I recommend you to look at, the, where they really calculate all the measures together, um, uh, including some wage policy measures for different household uh, types. It's, it's very detailed. And to be frank, what, what comes out is also quite amorphous and a little bit hard to, uh, uh, to summarize. But it seems to be... Um, a sort of, if there's a pattern, it's that the the, the high income uh, households did, did not so bad. Everybody did badly, not so badly, uh, because they were less affected in relative terms uh, uh, by the high inflation. And the, some low income families benefited from some of the, the measures that were targeted, um, and, and people in the middle got, as a proportion of their income, actually got hit hit the hit the hardest. Okay, overall, uh, uh, the Bruegel analysis and some other analysis we, we've seen points to the, the, the measures being sort of more un, untargeted towards in terms of uh, um, income distribution. So maybe this sort of timely aspect uh, um, uh, sort of won out over, over, uh, over, over targeting. Um, uh, how can I summarize this? The, the trade-off with, with ecological concerns, um, uh, you know, the, the, there are some win-win uh, policies out there in, in terms of counterinflation and um, ecological policies, but they again tend to lose out on the timely and on the stabilization aspect, right? Because they're, they're, they're good for both counterinflation and, uh, uh, and ecological uh, concerns, but in the longer run, like the classic sort of, you know, uh, helping people insulate their houses and, th and th things like that. Um, so maybe I'll skip these the, uh, these two examples. So we 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 did look a bit at the at the price caps. So price caps have been uh, quite heavily uh, criticised more from the sort of mainstream or liberal conservative economists um, because you know they supposedly encourage uh, uh, excessive consumption of, of fossil fuels. But in fact, um, well-designed policies um, have uh, you know the ability to distinguish between the average uh, the average price of consumption and the marginal price. Uh, again, my colleague here, Tom uh, Bar uh, Barman, who's sitting in the, in, the, in the front here, has, has done a lot of work on, on this. Okay, I have some tentative conclusions. Maybe I'll just leave them up there for a second because I've run out of, out of time. Uh, is that okay, Tom? And, uh, One last sentence. Sit down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we, we you know, uh, I didn't get around to talk so much about uh, uh, about price policy. I mean, maybe you, one, one sentence. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe talk for a second about Spain. Uh, um, you know, I, I mean, I think we've had this, a lot of this debate about strategic uh, 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 sectors for, for pricing, the, the work of um, Isabella Weber and, 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 and our colleagues. And you know, I think the Spanish case, maybe we get a chance to talk about that, in the, it does show that um, if, if, you, uh, if you can control uh, some, some key prices, in that case it was the electricity price, 
um, you can actually achieve quite a lot in a short space of time, as, if you, as you saw on the graph that I showed near, near the start. And the advantage of that is it, it, it sort of cuts, it sort of short circuits, you know, the processes that, 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 that Isabella Weber uh, sort of describes, that how uh, price increases feed into, uh, feed into uh, then higher nominal wages, right? And that's, that's essential. In a sense, I think what, you know, in one sentence explains the success of a country like um, uh, like uh, like Spain and why I, I think a country like uh, Austria, for example, and some Austrian colleagues in the, in the audience, uh, you know, they were very reluctant to adopt these uh, uh, price cutting uh, uh, policies. And then uh, when wage setting, when the last wage setting round uh, uh, started, uh, the relatively high rate of inflation over the last 12 months was fed into the nominal wages. Um, and now, uh, you know, in uh, Austria has, uh, has its inflation rate at, what was it, 7, 7 point something percent, right? So that's, I think, one of the, maybe the key findings. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>